up on something, I always worry about embarrassing him or the, the church. So y'all, please forgive me when I do goof up, but uh, I tend to do that quite often. But anyway, glad y'all love me and put it with me. Let me put it that way. So grateful. I'm going to be in over in 1 Samuel tonight. I am kind of stuck in the Old Testament, I guess. I don't know what it is about the Old Testament. A lot of the Old Testament scriptures really speak to me about some of the characters and things that happen. Wait a minute, 1 Samuel chapter 18 is where we'll start. I just love the Old Testament, and I'm loving the way that it applies to our lives today. And I don't know, but uh, every time I read something, I see things that look like things that are happening today that actually was in the Old Testament, believe it or not. I'm going to be down in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, all the way down in verse number number 5 here. Let me see. I think I'm one page ahead. All right. There we go. And the Bible says, And David went... Out, whether so Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they and it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing the dances to meet the king, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and, have, and to me they have ascribed but a thousand. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit of the, from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his, his presence twice. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for letting me be here tonight, Lord. Thank you for this message, Lord. I ask you to let me deliver it in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just ask you for it to be something that would be helpful to your people, Lord. And I know, if, Lord, if, if your people get help from it, Lord, I know for sure you'll get the glory and honor, Lord. That's all we're after tonight. In your Son Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So just considering this scripture tonight, I love the fact that the way David had behaved himself around the king. I'm not real tickled about how the king behaved himself around David, though. I'll tell you that up front. And the scriptures, of course, tell us that right off the bat. But if you'll notice how obedient David was to King Saul. And I love the phrase in here where it says, he behaved himself wisely. I really like that. You know, the king, the king at some point saw David as a stand-up, trustworthy fella. He had put David over the men of war. Now, I'm telling you, tonight I'm thinking that would be a place of honor in the king's uh, hierarchy of people to have David over his men of war. That's truly what where David was. And the thing that got me is at that point when David was appointed over the men of war, the king must have thought highly of David. He must have thought enough of this young man, and David was young at the time, to put him in such high position. And we know for sure, you know, David had slain Goliath and what all went on with that. And I'm sure that probably was taken into consideration as well. I mean, because the Bible tells us it was. But just imagine how David had this high authority in Saul's hierarchy of leadership. He truly did. That would have been likely a great place of honor, no doubt. And the other saying that really stood out to me too is, it says, And he was accepted in the sight of all people. And in Saul's servant, you know, the Lord saw fit to add more to it. The people was on David's side, or they saw David, they thought very highly of David. Saul thought highly of David. And then now you have Saul's servants, the ones that were really entrusted in Saul's inner circle there, they thought highly of David as well. 
But let's jump back to that first phrase that we saw here. That's my first point tonight. Behave yourself wisely. Now tonight I'm thinking I'm probably more preaching to myself than I am you because I don't know all of you that well. I love you all to pieces. So I don't know how you behave when you're outside of church. I only know you here. But I'm probably on this one here probably preaching just to me for this one here. But the thought is to behave yourself wisely. That same thought comes out of Psalms 102, verse number 2. It says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when thou come unto me, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Now, I know to me tonight, and maybe you as well, there's times that we walk in our homes and we don't really have a perfect heart. But the Bible's telling us that we need to be behaving ourselves widely. The psalmist thought to put it in there that we need to be walking in our house in a perfect heart. There's a lot of things that we have that go on in our homes, a lot of turmoil that happens, a lot of stress that happens. And can you honestly say tonight, I know I have a hard time saying it, that I am not always walking in my home with a perfect heart. But the Bible would have us to be walking in our home in a perfect heart and behaving ourselves widely. When I thought about that too, it only goes out further when you think even more about that. Behaving yourself wisely, and there are so many reasons a Christian really should behave themselves widely. wisely. When you think about it, if you carry yourself like a Christian, if you say you're a Christian, you really need to act like a Christian. I'm not saying you're not acting like one. I'm just saying all of us can strive to be better than we are, of course. Especially me, amen. But we need to be behaving ourselves widely. And that wisely means we would be behaving ourselves with joy in our heart. Uh, we don't behave ourselves wisely just because God is who He is and we're afraid of Him. It's a thing of love where we love Him so much. And we, He does so much for us that we, we don't even know all the things that He does. But we get kind of caught up in the things of life we don't really understand. But if we're behaving ourselves wisely in obedience to God, that's where He wants us to be. That's the peace that he gives us as a Christian. We behave ourselves widely and our lives are, are to show for it. It truly is. Behave like we have joy in our hearts. You know, a lot of times I know uh, it's hard sometimes to squeak out a smile. I get busy at things that I'm doing, and it's kind of a funny thing. Usually when I go somewhere to sing, I'm usually frowning the whole time because my mind's rolling on all the stuff i got to do. I'm like, did the instruments in? Are they tuned? What's next? What's this? And I'm, I'm thinking about that, and I don't usually sometimes remember to smile, but it's important to smile and behave myself wisely. That's something I truly have learned as I've gotten older to behave myself wisely. Amen. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, hmm. a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a particular people. I like being particular. You know, I really do. A particular people should show forth the praises of him who calleth you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. I like that marvelous light. Amen. He's done some stuff for us. When we behave ourselves wildly, when we walk among the world and even walk among other Christians, it strengthens them as well as it shows others, people that maybe aren't even saved, that we have something they, they really should get or we have something they really should want. You know, the Lord wants us to behave ourselves in a manner that makes others jealous of us as far as how much we love our God and how much joy we have. The others should look at a Christian and say, wow, I don't know why they're happy all the time, but I really got to have what they have. That's truly how we need to behave ourselves. Amen. Truly is. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse number 4 says As concerning therefore eating those things which are offered under sacrifices and idols. Now I brought that one up tonight because I wanted to tell you at one point before the Apostle Paul was dragged into a conversation about what was happening in Corinth there where people were eating things of idols and things. And the thought was as Paul went and told him he says you and I know as Satan Save people, believers in Jesus Christ, that those eating of the idols, they're just eating to nothing. There are no gods or anything. There's nothing really that's detrimental to us for that. But the problem being is if I'm doing that in a way that causes someone else to stumble, there's where the problem comes in. It truly does. It truly does. So tonight when we behave ourselves wisely, we would watch out because somebody's a-watching. 
I promise you, somebody is always watching. Especially when you say, I'm a Christian, or you try to tell people you're a Christian. Somebody is going to watch you in every aspect of your life, watching to see where they can go. Aha, I got him. See what? See how he acted there? Yeah. See how he acted? Somebody's always watching, I promise you. Amen. Your grandkids watch you. Your kids watch you. I always say a lot of times, too, and it's so true, is, you know, kids really are the, the little spies. I mean, they tell everything the parents has got going on. They tell everything the grandparents has got going on. They really do. They will do that. So it's always real important to behave yourself wisely around your children and grandchildren. And another thing, too, is, you know, God is real to me. I want my kids to see God so real to Dad. One of these days when I get old and maybe I don't even remember who I am, that's one thing I would really want my kids to say about me is, Oh, Daddy, he loves the Lord. God was always real to him. There was never a time when God, would, when Dad felt like God wasn't there. There was never a time when God didn't do things for Dad. And there was never a time when God just, just blessed him and Dad was just lost from him and worried about things. I want him to be able to say that about me when I get older. I really truly do. Notice in verse number 6 what it says. When David returned victorious in defeating the Philistines, all women came out to meet the king. They come out to meet the king, right? Okay. Saul, they come to meet King Saul, and it was King Saul. They were celebrating the victory of the enemy there. Now, what gets me kind of tickled about that is I can picture it in my mind because I like playing these things out, how the women was coming out of all the cities, it says in the Bible. I don't know how they knew they were coming out of all the cities. I guess the Holy Ghost just had to tell them this one when, when, um, when they was pinning this down. But truly, they came out. They were just celebrating victory. Maybe they were singing victory, victory. I don't know exactly what they were singing, but they were all in the street dancing and celebrating this great victory for the Hebrew pre people. The children of Israel were really celebrating this great victory. But the problem came in is when these ladies started singing this song and King Saul had heard it. It upset him. For it seems to me the song's of victory. And I thought about that. It puts me in the mind of that song. Palms of victory. I don't know if y'all know that one or not. But anyway, it puts me in the mind of that when I thought about it. They must have been singing something to that, that respect. Saul was king here. You know, David was Saul's servant at the time. And I know how it works in a corporate world, kind of, sort of. Normally, your people underneath you, they make you look good, and then it rolls up and it makes the next guy look good. And I'll be quite honest with you, just by how these ladies came out to greet the king and how they were celebrating this victory, someone may look into it and see all the things that Saul got upset about, but they were truly celebrating. And you know, really, Saul had some credit in getting... This praise here, he really did. He had the right man in charge of his men of war. He really truly did. But Saul never could tell. He, he didn't notice that. The only thing he got hung up on was this one song where they were singing, you know, David had slain these 10,000 to Saul's thousands. He got so upset he was hung up on it. He was hung up on it really bad. So number two tonight is never be upset at others' blessings. Amen. You know, Paul, uh, Saul was really upset at what was going on with it. David was getting praised. Yes, he was. But not as much as Saul had seen it happening here. The praise given to David was really upsetting. When I thought about this, I could just see old Saul sitting there, puckered lips, and he was soaking it up. His heart was getting all jealous. He was just steeping in madness and jealousy, and it was just getting more and more and more. And you know what? I know people like that. I don't know if y'all know people like that. I know people that will get mad when one of their neighbors gets something nice or the Lord blesses somebody. I've heard tell of it. You wouldn't believe how people sometimes get. You know, it's the thing, the thought of it is, is if the Lord is in your neighborhood, bless God, thank you, God, at least he's kind of nearby, right? Amen. Amen goes there. You know, he should have been happy the Lord was just blessing Israel at the time. Truly right. was. He should have been happy that David was his man fighting his wars for him. He should have sat back and just realized that. Notice in verse 8. Saul was very wroth at the saying displeased him. The wrath was kindled. The jealousy was multiplied. What more could he have, he asked. What more could he have but the kingdom? 
I didn't see where that was really a threat to the kingdom whatsoever, but Saul definitely saw it as a threat to the kingdom. In verse number 9, it tells us where the rubber meets the road with Saul here. It says, And Saul eyed David from that day forward. He put the evil eye on him. He sure did. He was upset about it. Put the evil eye on him. And when I thought about the evil eye that he got, I started thinking about what all the Lord told us when he was walking and talking in Luke chapter 11 here in verse number 34. It says, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body is full of light. But when thy eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. That's what happened. He put the evil eye on David there. The darkness crept in. And you know, all that stuff's amazing how it just ate him up. It really did. The evil eye ends up turning into a lustful eye. Then after that, it becomes bitter and turns into a very sinful eye. Number three tonight, talking about eyes and thinking about eyes, be careful of how you focus. If you think about the king here, Saul, he got so focused on the phrase and praise that David was getting, that's what really knocked him off his rocker, it truly did. His evil heart was burning. Just the division of David getting praise from these ladies here. And seeing these things only in David and not for himself. You know, for him, it was a matter of perspective. You know, we live in a world today where people feel like they, le they got left behind when things was, was given. They feel like somebody else has always got something that they didn't get. I mean, we, our whole society, I think it's America, truly maybe other countries, but America's really got a really bad sick problem now where we think somebody else got something we should have got. We feel entitled to what they have. Yep. They lost their focus. We've lost our focus on that. They focus on other things. Something else I'll always tell you and I'll notice is everybody always knows the grass is greener somewhere else until they get to where that grass is and it's no greener than it was at home. It's truly what happens. Like I said, remember Saul was totally in, in charge of David there. He was under command of the king. He would have done anything the king would have told him. He had control of this man that he was so jealous of and upset. In all honesty, that little bit of praise was pointless from those people. Now, if you remember back in our Bible, and I know you've written, read a lot about the children of Israel and stuff, but if you'll remember right, this kind of stood out to me too. It would have been short-lived. It truly would have. Because the children of Israel, they, they kind of went every which way. Somebody new would come along, they'd be praising that one. I mean, truly, they were that quick. In the same way with the Lord, they were so quickly turned away from God. Every time God rescued them or did something wonderful for them, massive and great for them, next thing you know, they were off in the weeds looking at idols and worshiping idols and worshiping cows. They were so quick to turn. So Saul's praise here, just, I mean, ups, being upset about the praise that David was getting was really just kind of crazy, believe it or not. Saul knew how these people would turn, but yet he still got so hung up and upset about it. He truly was. The eye caused his heart, to have, uh, his eye, his lack of vision caused him to have a heart condition, believe it or not. The eyesight was doing that for him. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus was talking to his disciples and explaining a parable. In verse number 20 it says, And he said, That which cometh out of a man, that defileth a man, for... From with, without the heart of men proceedeth evil thoughts, adulterers, former fornicators, murderers, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within that and defile a man. And I brought that verse up because all the stuff that Saul was having, all the trouble that he was having with his eyesight and his heart getting even blacker and meaner, it all come with inside of the man. It was sparked by some praise from someone else, but it was all truly something Saul had drummed up inside of himself, truly is. So tonight, that's a lot of that stuff that we have. If you struggle with some of the things I'm talking about tonight, it all comes from inside of you. It truly does. The Lord tells us that. Look with me here in verse number 10. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. He was so filled with that evil spirit, that blackened heart, that lack of vision, 
and that jealousy that he was ready to kill David. He truly was ready to kill him. You know, at the time the king was troubled and tormented just because he had truly had lost the Lord's favor. He truly had. The Lord was helping him out with the torment there by giving him an evil spirit. I guess that's why he was prophesying these crazy things maybe and so tormented by what, the, what was going on here. And at that time, David would play the harp to try to soothe him, help him out. Another point there is, not really a point, but another thought there is, David was there serving the king. I don't know why the king couldn't see what David was doing, but David had no qualms or anything where he was trying to take over or turn the king or never said anything bad about the king. David was there to serve the king, but the king missed it. He missed it. He surely did. Number four tonight is... Always be mindful of the spiritual authority. I never truly understood spiritual authority until I got to Bible college, but I'm looking at how David acted to the king here and how much he served the king and how his heart was set on the king. His spiritual authority, what a, 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 an example he set for that is amazing. You know, even though Saul was tormented and troubled and everything, King David did everything he could to try to help and comfort the, comfort the king. And you'll notice David didn't take credit for any of the stuff that he did. If he was one of those guys that was planning on taking over or taking over the king's thing right off the bat, he would have been one that was trying to sneak around behind Saul's back and take credit for every little thing that Saul, was, Saul had put him to do, but he didn't do that. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7, it says, Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversations. I thought about that. Spiritual authority was really important here. You know, David knew that the Lord had put the king in charge. He knew the King Saul was the king. He knew it was the Lord's doing to take King Saul out of the kingship. It wasn't David's doing. David was there serving the king with such a great example of spiritual authority there. Amazing, amazing. Amazing. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 17 says, Obey them that have a rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch your souls, as they must give an account. You know, folks that are over you in authority, even at the workplace, we always need to be very respectful of them and be mindful of them, because that's what the Lord expects of us. I've worked with people and sometimes it's like herding cats and they just want to rebel against leadership. That's really not what to do. You're supposed to jump on with leadership and find out what they need and go for it for their sake. Because they're in charge of you. They're responsible for you. That's the way David looked at it from King Saul. New King Saul was in charge. He was taking care of King Saul and doing everything he could. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, for to, uh, to know them that which labor among you, that are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. That's an important fact to keep in mind. The ones that are in charge of you are the ones that the Lord's put in charge of you. The Lord had a reason to put those people in charge. Our spiritual authority should be focused on those people, just like David's was here for the king. There's so much more to say about spiritual authority, but I got one more point tonight. Number five, and this is the big one here. Remember, jealousy always leads to death. It truly does. Now, I don't know if you guys have trouble with that or not, but I'm saying whoever hears this message tonight, if it helps them at all, jealousy always leads to death. It truly does. Look at with me in verse number 11. It says, And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David, even unto the wall with it. And David avoided out of the, his presence twice. I think he skipped away. Of course, it was the Lord's will to make sure David would never have been harmed, of course. But the hatred was there. The jealousy was there to the point where he was ready to kill David. He truly was. Now, keep that in mind as you think about folks that have trouble with jealousy, or maybe we've had that in our hearts before. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 4 it says, Wrath is cruel, anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Amen goes there. And it reminded me of how Joseph's brother sold him into slavery over in Exodus. 
They were jealous of his coat of many colors. They were jealous of the, the love that the father had. Now remember those boys? They were up the hierarchy in the family. They were the sons that would get things before Joseph would have got things as far as the inheritance go. And maybe Joseph being last, he would have got very little because of the other ones that had been taken care of. They didn't see that. All they saw was the jealousy they had for their brother, sold them into slavery. Same thing with Jacob's wives, Rachel and Leah, if you remember right in Genesis chapter 30, verse number 1. And then the Bible says, And when Rachel saw that she was bare, uh, saw that she was bare Jacob, no, uh, no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Well, that phrase upset Jacob. Yeah. And his anger was kindled. He was angry. All because of that envy. And we know the trouble that that caused. It caused sin and more sin. So tonight I leave you with that one. Jealousy always leads to death. It truly does. But there's a way out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 13 it says, There hath no temptation taken over, over you but such as it is common for man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with temptation also make a way of escape. Amen. So I don't know tonight if you've struggled with, uh, struggle with jealousy, struggle with troubles that we're talking about tonight, but I'm telling you the way out is the Lord. He can definitely help us with it. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you tonight for letting me be here, Lord. I ask you to bless our time together, Lord. Help the folks get home safely tonight, Lord. And uh, bless our preacher as he comes. In your son Jesus' most precious name I ask. Amen.